coming up on Theater Talk. I want a, your true, honest, unvarnished opinion about the new Spider-Man. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm the show's producer, Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. So, Michael, the big play winner last night was War Horse. Five Tony Awards, including Best Play. It's an extraordinary, extraordinary play about a, a young boy and his horse fighting in the battlefields in France in World War I. It is on Broadway because of the National Theater of Great Britain, which has become really kind of a, an engine, I think, of Broadway now, Susan. A lot of great productions are coming out of the National Theater, including The History Boys, which you and I both loved. And I think this is uh, largely due to the efforts of one man, the absolutely brilliant director and producer, Nicholas Heitner, who is the head of the National Theater and is our guest tonight on Theater Talk. Welcome. Thank you very much. Your, your debut here on Theater Hawk. It is, yes. Um, well, congratulations on the Tony Award for War, ha War Horse. And you were saying earlier you didn't think you were going to win. Who did you think would get it? Oh, I didn't know who would get it, but, uh, but it, seemed, it seemed a stretch to me that, uh, that it should win Best Play. Well, d um, d maybe I'm mired in tradition, but uh, Best Plays um, suggest to me the product of one powerful literary imagination and warhorse is much more of a of a collaborative a collaborative effort it, uh, it's been beautifully adapted but but the show is 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 put together from all sorts of disparate theater crafts mm -hmm. and and is less the production of a play than a kind of uh, total theater a right. sum of its parts well that yeah. was that was being said it, one of the things that was being said about the show at the time was that it's a beautiful production with these gorgeous puppets and it's so moving but the play itself is kind of a simple story based on a children's story and maybe the award should go to a play like the mother with the hat or good people which is a more traditional kind of play but i mean where would you stand on that? Don't you think in theater it's the total experience that you just can't look at the text? You have to take into account all of the production elements and values. That ultimately is the experience of going to the theater, isn't it? Yeah, I'm very happy to go with that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, you I'm, very, I'm very happy to take your word for it. In fact, I think it's, in fact, I think it's a very, very skillful adaptation. And in fact, it's um, uh, the book, which is a children's book, mm -hmm. uh, for, uh, a book for slightly older children. Uh, is itself a, a beautiful piece of storytelling and as it happens right within the mainstream of first world war literature because um with the exception of the most famous first world war poet R wilfred owen mm -hmm. virtually all the first world war writers uh, could only write about it in reference to uh, uh pre-first world war uh, world war arcadia that that there is always a strong element of the lost pastoral in all the great literature of the uh, of the first world first world war in Siegfried Sassoon and, and, and Edmund Blundell uh, that they're all of them insistent on remembering what it was like before the world fell so I do think it it, it has um, it has a kind of literary legitimacy and its simplicity is of the, the simplicity of the adaptation is very much uh, yes. what we all what we all wanted. Now this show not only is uh, a success artistically, but this is a very big commercial hit for the National Theater yeah. here at Lincoln Center, where the show is running. You're grossing almost a million dollars a week. Yeah. The show is hugely popular in the West End. Is this your a chorus line? Is this will this do for the National Theater what a chorus line did for Joe Papp's Public Theater years ago? Just bring the money in and help you uh, build up the theater. Well, we're certainly going to try to make it something like that. It, it, this was uh, this felt like um, nothing commercial when we started work on it. Uh, one of the things we've been doing the last few years is is trying to produce um, every couple of years uh, an ambitious family show. A show uh, there there is a tradition uh, in London. Uh, there's a tradition in the British theatre of the Christmas show. Yeah, the pantomime. I th yeah, I think it's not a, it's not a tradition that that uh, that you guys share. Uh, and what we were trying to do, what we've been trying to do since 2003, is offer a twist on that, taking ambitious ambitious children's literature, children's literature which offers more than than the retelling of an old fairy tale, right. and and to try to make um, really, uh, as far as we could, quite groundbreaking theatre out of it. Uh, Warhorse was. Uh, 
was going to be one of those. And it, it was suggested to me by one of the two directors, Tom Morris, uh, who showed me the book and told me about Handspring. Uh, I'd not come across Handspring. The I was they're, wondering, did you know the puppet makers? They're the puppet makers. I, yeah, sure. I didn't know about Handspring until Tom told me about but it. But he did, yes. Tom, be before he became um, an associate director uh, at the National, uh, ran a, a brilliant fringe powerhouse in London called Battersea Arts Centre. So Tom knew Handspring from the international arts circuit, mm. and uh, uh, and uh, he, I saw their work on DVD. I met them. I saw some of their work. Uh, meanwhile, uh, work was done on the adaptation of War Horse, and there were also workshops just seeing whether the emotional burden of a show could be carried by a non-speaking horse. And quite seriously, the 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 uh, the day when I decided that we'd just go ahead and uh, and do this show. Uh, was the day I saw four actors with cardboard boxes on their heads <laughs> walking around in circles at our studio where we where we do a, the kind of um, where we do all our investigations. Your laboratory, so, sort yeah, of. Yeah, it's uh, um, and uh, there was a there was just a sniff of something really expressive and really extraordinary going on. It reminds me of the time um, Michael Eisner said uh, when they were they hired Julie Tamer to The Lion King. She came into his office with her little puppet models and just was pushing them around on the desk, yeah. and it was then he said, we'll go with that, yeah. we'll do that. There's that moment as a producer where you just, you have to take the leap, right? It moves you in some way, some, some, you pick up on something going It's on. exactly that, and of course I'm a producer who, who only became a producer through being a director, right. uh, and, and have only been a producer since 2003 at the National Theatre. I have to say, it's, uh, although I won't say at the National Theatre forever, it, being a producer is something I now love being, and I can't imagine going back to merely being a director. Why? I love that sense that I'm sure Michael Eisner got when he talked to Julie Tamer of uh, a theatre maker being completely convinced and possessed. And it's, it's relatively straightforward for me. I have, um, I have uh, public investment. I have a lot of government money that, that, that enables me at the National 20 times a year, if I want to, to take 20 risks. Mm. Uh, I never have to, uh, I never have to, by design, play safe. Uh, obviously, in constructing a twenty-play repertoire, you're you're going to you're going to balance shows with wide popular appeal, or what you hope is going to be wide popular appeal, right. with shows that you simply want to do because the people talking to you about the shows or the script in front of you burns with conviction. Yeah. That I absolutely love, and there's no mistaking it. And it's that that you go with. You go with the artists you trust, mm. the people you know make theatre because that's all there is for them to do in their lives they just they, there's nothing else that will that will fulfill them if you ever start to go with something because you think yeah that hits the buttons mm. we've been there before and we know it works that's when it all starts to go downhill yeah. and um uh, it, it's uh, it, if uh, if i'm making arguments to our political masters back in london uh in favor of government investment uh that's in the end where I end up. It's, it enables us to do the things which you wouldn't otherwise be able to do, and those so often are the things that it turns out everybody wants and to And take be. the chances. Let me ask you, when you have a hit like War Horse, we have seen in our nonprofit theaters here in America, the Public Theater, for example, and the Roundabout, <clears throat> and Lincoln Center to some extent, they get a taste of that big hit and the money that comes in, and then they start programming for the next hit. And I have seen a lot of the nonprofits here chase that next big winner, that next big hit. They want to be part of Broadway. They've made big investments to have their theaters on Broadway. They want to win Tony Awards. Is there that danger when you have a taste of the success that someone in the National Theater, maybe not you, but maybe your successor, will think, we need another war horse? I think what we've discovered is that if you start to manufacture one of those hits, it never works. Uh, what you've got to do is always respond um, to the talent that you have around you, and the material that turns you on. And it is so often the stuff that feels like it's f from off center mm. uh, that turns into the success. Oh, we just have a few minutes left, but I want to get a sense for you what's going on at the National this summer and the fall, because we have a lot of New Yorkers who go to London, and everyone makes the pilgrimage to the National. Um, I know you've just opened a play you've directed that got wonderful reviews, One Man, Two Govs, based on the Goldoni play Servant of Two Masters. Um, you want to promote that uh, <laughs> for a little bit there? I, I hear it's the funniest thing there since your last hit you directed, London Assurance. Yeah, it's... Um 
it's even less substantial than London Assurance. <laughs> it exists. It exists only to make you laugh, which, uh, which, it's in a fine a thing to aspire to. I in think. a repertoire of twenty plays, uh, it's it's uh, it's a good thing to do, and it seems to be doing that. It is it is making audiences laugh a lot, and it and it's uh, at the centre of it is is a guy called James Corden, who you may remember from the History Boys. He, he was, was the big the big was, History Boy. He was the big guy. Uh, at the other extreme, we are presenting the three and a half hour premiere of a middle period Ibsen play called Emperor and Galilean, which has never been seen. It's, uh, it's Why not? It, because it's long, demanding, <laughs> ambitious, and about the Emperor Julian the Apostate. But it's it, the next war horse. It, <laughs> <laughs> you never know. It's, uh, it, it, has its, it has its press opening on Wednesday. I'm going back for it. Oh. Uh, and it's, uh, and it's, it's massive, demanding, serious, a cast of 50. I kind of think only we can do that kind of thing. Yeah. I want to quickly say, mm. you've got a wonderful program of showing uh, national theater productions all over the country in public auditoriums on, on, on live video. We do. This has been a, a tremendous and unexpected success. NT Live, it's called. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, the idea was inspired by what the Metropol Metropolitan Opera are doing. P yeah. P Peter Gelb started this at the moment. Broadcasting in Times Square. The yeah, office. we broadcast live in the UK and as live five hours later or eight hours li later here. Now six or seven shows a year and several screens in New York. And you can find this on our website, on the National Theatre website. When up to about a third, we'll eventually be at a half our repertoire. You can see wherever you live. That's there, right. There's a, there's a screen near you. It doesn't feel like the movies. Nope. Are you going to do that three and a half hour Ibsen play? No, that's <laughs> it. Strange, strange, strange enough. <laughs> that's not uh, my, my, my inner Disney took over and, <laughs> and, and decided <laughs> not for the big screen. <laughs> no, all right. Well, listen, uh, congratulations, Nick Heitner, the Sir head of the, Nicholas. Sir, Sir Nicholas Heitner, I must say, the uh, head of the <laughs> National Theatre. That's, Great that's the most absurd thing you've said so far, <laughs> though it's true. Uh, anyway, tremendously talented producer and director whose uh, theatre just won five Tony Awards for its extraordinary production of War Horse. Nicholas Heitner, thanks for being our guest today on Theatre Talk. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Pleasure. Michael, I thought the Tony Awards were pretty good. Yeah, they weren't bad. Actually, usually the award show is dreadful and terrible and the ratings are awful. But this year, I thought Neil Patrick Harris put on a zippy kind of a fun show. And it celebrated a very, very big season on Broadway with an annual gross this year, I think, over $1 billion. Oh. So here to sort of uh, one last look back on the season and a little discussion about what happened at the Tony Awards this week. We are joined by our panel of so-called experts. <laughs> uh, Michael Musto from the Village Voice, who watches the Tonys always in your pajamas at home, correct? <laughs> yes, but I do go to the after party for free food. And by the way, I'm the last in a long line of bumblebees. <laughs> <laughs> you had to see this. Yeah, show. you know for that one. There you go. And Patrick Pacheco from New York One on Stage, who I watched you at the red carpet. Oh, great. Interviewing Bobby Lopez, one of the creators of the Book of Mormon, and you had this massive microphone, and you went like this, and practically knocked the guy over. Whoa, get out of here. What, are you trying to kill the nominees at the red carpet, Patrick? No, we were having a little bit of a sound problem, so they kept saying, push it closer, closer, in my my eye of thee. And another person who watches the Tonys from his home because he is never invited to the event, to the after party. <laughs> I'm going to have to look into Any why that is. <laughs> I... Jesse Green from New York Magazine. Welcome to Theater Talk. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. All right, Michael Musto, what did you think of this year's telecast? Is it a cut above of what we've seen in the past? It was. It was pretty delightful. Even the annoying parts were kind of fun because they were mm. annoying in a fun way. Uh, what was Mark... the, mo the most annoying part for you? Uh, maybe Mark Rylance's anti-speech. <laughs> I don't want attention, but look at me. Francis... Mark Rylance. Lance won Best Actor for Jerusalem. Right. right. Francis McDormand's anti-glamour, which takes more effort actually to look that raw than it does to doll <laughs> yourself up. It's like, where you, it, but it's a great it's statement. It looked it. like she was dressed for her first day of third grade. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think Whoopi Goldberg had used up every costume backstage, and that's all that was left. I was at the uh, the Tony Ball after the, of course you after were the fans telecast fans. and talking to Daniel Sullivan. And we were talking the director about of the, the director of it. And he said, um, he saw uh, Francis and said, Francis, the, the, you look great. She said, well, I got this dress for 60 bucks uh, off, you know, off it's some thrift shop. She was robbed. And I said, and why are you wearing the Levi jacket? And he says, to protect the dress. <laughs> Spoken, spoken like a true artist. It has to be said, though she gave a fantastic performance, so who the hell cares what she was wearing to accept the award? Yeah, and, and Mark Rylance, too. They yes. can do whatever they want. Well, I, I thought, actually, as, as 
slightly incoherent as it was, uh, Nikki M. James's Bumblebee yeah. speech for winning um, for the Book of Mormon supporting actress, I thought, you know, here is somebody at the beginning of, of a career, and she's not slick like the Alec Baldwins and the Hugh Jackmans and the John Larroquettes who give very polished, slick speeches. And you really felt this is a genuine moment in what is basically a phony business. But I'm not a big fan of that kind of, I didn't prepare a speech. Here's a 10-minute speech. It hurts. <laughs> <laughs> kind right of speech. down to the bumblebee. <laughs> I think Sutton Foster did, and, and Nikki's new and she's she won and it, she's wonderful. Sutton Foster really has perfected that kind of emotional yet controlled, not too self-congratulatory, yet heartfelt speech. <laughs> and, and, to her, and to her dresser, no less. Uh, oh, yeah, to her I think next she year you should get all the dressers who were thanked <laughs> yes. and have them do a panel because <laughs> they apparently know a lot more than we do. Yeah, that that, that, that do. would be sure that Broadway's not any gay anymore. That would uh, kind of undermine. And that was the theme of the evening. What did you think of that opening number? Neil Patrick Harris comes out and he does. I the, thought, it's kind of an old saw, though. Broadway's full of gays and Jews. And yeah, it, it reminded me of the Spamalot number. But, yeah, yeah, exactly. you know, you have to be exactly. Jewish to get to Broadway or yeah. whatever. But I thought it was very clever. Written it, by it was David. written by David Jabberbaum. Yeah. Yes. May I say, I'm the only Jew in and this room, and I was not invited. So can we? <laughs> <laughs> or, or perhaps not. <laughs> no, I, I thought it was covered. hilarious. And, it, and I thought that only Neil Patrick Harris could pull it off, too. And how gay was that telecast? I mean, Hugh Jackman dancing around to funny girl songs. Oh, my God. <laughs> Larry <laughs> Kramer, Martha Wash. I mean, you know. Well, and the last line of, <laughs> the, of their number together was, if, baby, you're the bottom, I'm the top. I you know. know. <laughs> I don't know where to go I with that. that. But Neil Patrick Harris and, and Hugh Jackman said, but if baby I'm the bottom, you're the top. <laughs> I thought, boy, there's a lot of stuff going on. But I, I turned straight again. I mean, <laughs> I don't you know, want to play I, my actually, beautiful when one, of the, one of the South Park guys actually thanked his wife, and the whole room was like, <gasps> <laughs> heart attack time. But I appreciated it because I think it's good to get rid of the illusion that millions of people might be drawn into watching this if they thought it was straighter or more Midwestern or whatever it is they <laughs> they might think this show is for who it's for and you might as well entertain them and this show did a better job than most in recent years of actually providing entertainment yeah, yeah. any idea what the numbers were uh, no I have not I haven't heard I can't imagine that they were through the roof I think there was a rerun of murder she wrote on Hallmark which and and, and, the, and the and the basketball NBA game. championship I wanted to say though just in terms of the the production numbers on the telecast because these are very important for the yeah. shows to generate ticket sales I actually found that uh, when the Book of Mormon just did I Believe with one guy, it was more effective than having yet another big production number with people just jumping around, which I think becomes kind of numbing after a it's, while. It's very hard to film those things well, and they tend to get flat visually and flat orally, unless my TV is bad. But uh, the, the, uh, the shows that chose to do something small and intimate, including, in my opinion, Spider-Man, yeah, yeah. came off better. Really? I, I, not that the others came off poorly, yeah. but if you've seen those other shows in the theater, there's no comparison. Yeah. Between how they come off. Well, I agree with you on I agree with you on uh, wonderful and Andrew Reynolds, but I think the Spider Man thing was dull, and I thought they should have had some acrobats jumping around. Well, they could. No, no, they, they couldn't fall. That they in the <laughs> kill. That would have driven the ratings up. Michael, you were going to say. Book of Mormon didn't do that number because it's the best number. No. Every other number would have been. Yeah, every other number would have been bleeped more than Brooke Shields. Yeah, I think generally what is considered the greatest Tony performance on a telecast of all time was uh, Jennifer Holiday doing. And I'm telling you, I'm not going from Dreamgirls. And when you have a powerful performer like that and a song that tells a little bit of a story, you know, she's out of the group. Mm -hmm. Here with Andrew Reynolds, you have, you know, he's the Mormon and he's uh, certifying his belief and it's funny jokes. It works more than just, you know, another I am the brotherhood of man, arms flying and people bouncing around. I, I wonder, we, we're so sad. We're so savvy because we're on the inside. We savvy. the show. <laughs> I mean, in terms of what the shows are all about. <laughs> <laughs> That's a Mormon. Thanks, Cartman. Yes. It's hard to say what somebody that has no idea yeah. what Mormon is about would make of that. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, I was trying to describe Mormon on paper to people that were at dinner the other night, and their mouths were agape. They had no idea how this could be the toughest ticket on Broadway, which is a compliment to it. The advance to that show is now almost $30 million. Oh, really? Didn't I mean, they crash the website last they, night? And they crashed Telecharge last night yeah. after, after Anno Rannells, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to say I thought the highlight for me and the funniest joke in, I think, the history of the Tony Awards was when Bono and the Edge got on there. Yeah. And they said, we could have opened this show in February. 
but we, we want to keep the New York Post in suspense. I thought, you know, good, good, good for them to acknowledge my contribution to the current Broadway season. Yeah, well, that's what it's all about, Mike. Yeah. And segueing into that, gentlemen, Spider-Man has just opened. We have all seen it. This is the new version after they, they threw Julie uh. Taymor under the bus. I want your, and I don't want any Weasling out here because we're sucking up to Bono in the Edge. I know you were at their party at the Carlisle, Michael. Free food. Uh -huh. And I know you're still close to Tamor and she still gets royalty from this and I know you'll suck up to any big million dollar music. I want a, your true, honest, unvarnished opinion about the new Spider-Man. Jesse. Not my cup of tea. <laughs> yeah, why? Um, to be honest, I it's just not I wouldn't it wouldn't appeal to me no matter how good it was and I think it's uh for all the things about it that are thrilling and they are and the Spider-Man guy landed right next to me and I jumped out of my seat. That was great. It's banal. Michael? Well, in my column I'm comparing it to Anthony Weiner's Privates in that they're <laughs> spectacular and really boring at the same time. <laughs> uh, and I um, Bono is my new best friend, but I have to say I don't understand why he was so out to <laughs> why he was so out to get uh, <laughs> to say that Julie Tamar was too close to the material to blah blah blah. It was all true, but I think the main problem with the show is the score. Yeah, we don't, as you saw from the Tonys the other night, uh, you don't want to hear one more dirge. No, it's no. sludge. The, the score is sludge-like. Patrick, you want to have a go at it? Or I think, you gotta I think it's brilliant. It? I think it's great. <laughs> I think they've turned it around. Oh I think it's going to run for 50 years. <laughs> it's going to make all its money back. It's going to have a tremendous thing, a uh, tremendous tour. <laughs> and my friend's the associate director. Uh, <laughs> Come on, your honest opinion. Uh, you were bored out of your had, mind. I it guess. had a lot of work to do. <laughs> a lot of work to do. It just, it, oh, yes. They've been working on it for <laughs> nine years. They should work on it a little bit more. Yeah, he weaseled, he weaseled out. He weaseled out. <laughs> what was inept and pretentious and boring under Julie Taymor is now just boring. I was surprised that it still runs for two hours and 40 minutes. They have made it coherent. You can follow the plot. But really, to what end? It's just, it's, it's deadly dull. The book is dull. The score is dull. And Listen, I think a lot of the performances are dull. It's not for you, then. Yeah. Look, <laughs> who's yeah. it for? Well, my, <laughs> Patrick Pacheco. My 17-year-old went to see it with me, and he got home and went on Facebook and, and wrote, it was like the best show since the Book of Mormon. Okay, since the Book of Mormon. But still, th that's who it's for. And yeah. God bless them if they enjoy it. It's for teenage boys. Whose parents will indulge them. <laughs> and Susan, you saw it. What do you want to say? Well, you know, my my cousin was a geek and got fired, so I'm recusing myself. <laughs> oh, my God, we can never talk about any show ever again. <laughs> I will only say this in defense no. of Julie. I will say only this in defense of Julie Taymor. That is, as bad as her show was, there was a a crazy, insane, but creative mind at work there. It had gone off the rails, but it was kind of spectacular to see it. And now they just have a bunch of not terribly creative, but efficient people. And they have a not terribly creative, but efficient kind of a show. But it runs better. It runs better can it, than can it, it did before. Can it make back $80 million on Broadway? Not on Broadway. I mean, theoretically it could, but I don't believe that. But right. I think it can eventually make back its money through other means. Right. Uh, we got to wrap it up, but looking ahead to the next season in the fall, Michael, what's on your radar screen? Uh, we have The Mountaintop, uh, a play mm. from England uh, with Samuel Jackson. I, wow, you, okay. you asked me without warning. <laughs> well, it's interesting, so, though, though, because... Of uh, uh, well, okay, we have Godspell. <laughs> Godspell, okay. We have hippie doopy Jesus stuff. Sorry, Religion Francis McDormand in her singing. denim jacket. <laughs> there are no new musicals yet. That's a very important oh, point. Really? Yeah. There is not so a... So Spider-Man could get nominated. Uh, it could. It could win next now, year. In the spring, there there are a few coming. Yeah, but, but there are no, nothing in the fall. There are no new musicals coming. There are some very good plays, as Michael was saying. And Mountaintop, we should say, is uh, from London. Oh. It's about Martin Luther. And there's Martin. a new King play called Detroit Samuel from Jackson. Stephen Wolf. Yes, which, uh, which got very good reviews. Patrick, what do right. you think? There's, uh, I think, Best Man. I mean, it may be too early to revive it. Jeffrey Richards is reviving it. But it is with James Earl Jones. And I hear Angela Lansbury may do it. What are you laughing <laughs> I didn't understand one word him and Vanessa Redgrave said. <laughs> on the they were just saying words like shrine, <laughs> <laughs> window. <laughs> what are they talking about? I know, I mean, I know they're great. Too many boards have been <laughs> drawn on this theater. Did you prefer Christy Brinkley? <laughs> she was so peppy. <laughs> every, every word was italicized. And Scottsboro so Boys look like a slap happy fun show, didn't they? No, and it's about a guy. Hey, 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 hey. Rape. What is, uh, what is uh, Scott Rudin have coming up? Uh, Does he have anything? Well, Scott Rudin has... He had only four this season. Scott Rudin, who in now this 
dominates Broadway. He's got the revival of um, Sweet Bird of Youth. With oh, that's it. If it's Parker. happening, it's not been confirmed yet. Yeah, and I also James Franco. James Franco watches theater talk, I'm told. So <laughs> hi, James. <laughs> you were brilliant on the Oscars. Looking forward to having you as guest on theater. Also, we should say Philip Seymour Hoffman is going to be uh, doing Willie Loman in Death of a Salesman, directed by Mike, Mike Nichols, Nichols, which could be interesting. Uh -huh. But I think the wild card is uh, what is that new musical that is going to set the town a buzz, and it's, it's not going to be Spider-Man, as we Somebody know. should take right. advantage of the fact that there are none. And come in. <laughs> yeah. And come in. Yeah. I would say keep your eye on a musical see. called Matilda from London. That from is the Raoul Dahl? Uh, from the Raoul Dahl uh, children's story. It's a, suppo I haven't seen it, but it's supposedly a brilliant, brilliant musical, and they may try to slip that in early. Marianne Elliott, who co-directed War Horse, right. is doing a musical with Tori Amos Oh, what's it, what's uh, it called The Light Princess. Oh, I thought she was doing The Spice Girls. Uh, Marianne uh, Elliott was doing The Spice Girls. I, I could swear uh, I saw a tweet right. to she that may well have been doing night. it, but that's what she said on the red carpet, that oh. she was doing a musical with Tori Amos, and it's called The Light Princess. <laughs> I haven't been so bored since I sat through Spider-Man the other night. <laughs> <laughs> a right. Tori Amos musical. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, on that note, we, guys, we'll have you back in the fall to uh, bash all the shows before <laughs> they've opened. Uh, Michael Musto from The Village Voice. Glad to see a Tori Spelling musical. <laughs> <laughs> Jesse Green from New York Magazine. And Patrick Pacheco from Spider-Man, Turn Off the Dark. Thank you, please. <laughs> <laughs> thanks very much. Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Alan S. Gordon Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. We welcome your questions or comments for Theater Talk. Thank you and good night. <laughs>